Section number 19 of Astounding Stories 11, November 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Dempsey, Highland, New York. Astounding Stories 11, November 1930. By Various. Vagabonds of Space. A Complete Novelette by Harl Vincent Chapter 1 The Nomad Gathered around a long table in a luxuriously furnished director's room, a group of men listened in astonishment to the rapid and forceful speech of one of their number. "'I tell you I'm through, gentlemen,' averred the speaker. I'm fed up with the job, that's all. Since 2317, you've had me sitting at the helm of International Airways, and I've worked my fool head off for you. Now get someone else. Made plenty of money yourself, didn't you, Carr? Asked one of the directors, a corpulent man with a self-satisfied countenance. Sure I did. That's not the point. I've done all the work. There's not another executive in the outfit whose job is more than a title, and you know it. I want a change and a rest. Going to take it, too. So go ahead with your election of officers and leave me out. Your stock. Courtney Davis, the chairman of the board, sensed that Carr Parker meant what he had said. I'll hold it. The rest of you can vote it as you choose. Divide the proxies pro rata based on your individual holdings. But I reserve the right to dump it all on the market at the first sign of shady dealings. That suit you? The recalcitrant young president of International Airways had risen from the table. The chairman attempted to restrain him. Come on now, Carr, let's reason this out. Perhaps if you just took a leave of absence. Call it anything you want. I'm done right now. Carr Parker stalked from the room, leaving eleven perspiring capitalists to argue over his action. He rushed to the corridor and nervously pressed the call button of the elevators. A minute later he emerged upon the roof of the Airways Building, one of the tallest of New York's midtown skyscrapers. The air here, fifteen hundred feet above the hot street, was cool and fresh. He walked across the great flat surface of the landing stage to inspect a tiny helicopter which had just settled to a landing. Angered as he was, he could still not resist the attraction of these trim little craft had always held for him. The feeling was in his blood. His interest, however, was short-lived, and he strolled to the observation aisle along the edge of the landing stage. He stared moodily into the heavens where thousands of aircraft of all descriptions sped hither and yon. A huge liner of the Martian route was dropping from the skies and drifting toward her cradle on Long Island. He looked out over the city to the north. Fifty miles of it, he knew, stretched along the east shore of the Hudson. Greatest of the cities of the world, it housed a fifth of the population of the United States of North America, a third of the wealth. Cities. The entire world lived in them. Civilization was too highly developed nowadays. Adventure was a thing of the past. Of course, there were other planets, Mars and Venus, but they were as bad. At least he had found them so on his every business trip. He wished he had lived a couple of centuries ago when the first spaceships ventured forth from the Earth. Those were the days of excitement and daring enterprise. Then a man could find ways of getting away from things, next to nature, out in the forests, hunting, fishing. But the forests were gone, the streams enslaved by power monopolies. There were only the cities and barren plains. Everything in life was made by man. Artificial. Something drew his eyes upward, and he spotted an unusual object in the heavens, a mere speck as yet, but drawing swiftly in from the upper air lanes. But this ship, small though it appeared, stood out from among its fellows for some reason. Carr rubbed his eyes to clear his vision. Was it? Yes, it was, surrounded by a luminous haze. Notwithstanding the brilliance of the afternoon sun, this haze was clearly visible. A silver shimmering that was not like anything he had seen on earth. The ship swung in toward the city and was losing altitude rapidly. Its silvery aura deserted it, and the vessel was revealed as a sleek, tapered cylinder with no wings, rudders, or helicopter screws. 
Like the giant liners of the interplanetary service, it displayed no visible means of support or propulsion. This was no ordinary vessel. Carr watched in extreme interest as it circled the city in a huge spiral, settling lower at each turn. It seemed that the pilot was searching for a definite landing stage. Then suddenly it swooped with a rush, straight for the stage of the airways building. The strange aura reappeared, and the little vessel halted in mid-air, poised a moment, then dropped gracefully and lightly as a feather to the level surface not a hundred feet from where he stood. He hurried to the spot to examine the strange craft. Mado! he exclaimed in surprise as a husky bronzed Martian squeezed through the quickly opening manhole and clambered heavily to the platform. Mado of Canix, an old friend. Devils of Terra! gasped the Martian, his knees giving way. Your murderous gravity! Air, help me! I've forgotten the energizing switch! Carr laughed as he fumbled with a mechanism that was strapped to the Martian's back. Mado, who tipped the scales at over two hundred pounds on his own planet, weighed nearly six hundred here. His legs simply couldn't carry the load. There you are, old man. Parker had located the switch, and a musical purr came from the black box between the Martian's broad shoulders. Now stand up and tell me what you're doing here, and what's the idea of the private ship? Come all the way from home in it? His friend struggled to his feet with an effort, for the field emanating from the black box required a few seconds to reach the intensity necessary to counteract two-thirds of the Earth's gravity. Thanks, Carr, he grinned. Yes, I came all the way in that bus. Alone, too. And she's mine. What do you think of her? A peach, from what I can see. But how come? Not using a private space flyer on your business trips, are you? Not on your life. I've retired. Going to play around for a few years. That's why I bought the Nomad. Retired? Why, Mado? I just did the same thing. <laughs> Great stuff. They've worked you to death. What are you figuring on doing with yourself? Carr shrugged his shoulders resignedly. Usual thing, I suppose. Travel aimlessly and bore myself into old age. Nothing else to do. No kick out of life these days at all, Mado. Even in chasing around from planet to planet, they're all the same. The Martian looked keenly at his friend. Oh, is that so? he said. No kick, eh? Well, let me tell you, Car Parker, you come with me and we'll find something you'll get a kick out of. Ever see the Sargasso Sea of the solar system? Ever been on one of the asteroids? Ever seen the other side of the moon? Uranus? Neptune? Planet Nine? The farthest out from our sun? No. Carr's eyes brightened somewhat. And you haven't seen anything or been anywhere. Trouble with you is you've been in the rut too long, thinking there's nothing left in the universe but the commonplace. Right, too, if you stick to the regular routes of travel. But the nomad's different. I'm just a rover when I'm at her control, a vagabond in space, free as the ether that surrounds her airtight hull. And take it from me, there's something to see and do out there in space, off the usual lanes perhaps, but it's there. You've been out how long? Carr hesitated. Eighty Martian days? Seen plenty, too. He waved his arm in a gesture that seemed to take in the entire universe. Why come here with so much to be seen out there? Come to visit you, old stick in the mud, grinned Mado, and try and persuade you to join me. I find you footloose already. You're itching for adventure, excitement. Will you come? Carr listened spellbound. Right now, he asked. This very minute. Come on. My bag, objected Carr. It must be packed. I'll need funds, too. Bag? What for? There's plenty of duds on the Nomad. For any old climate. And money. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. Vagabonds need money? He backed toward the open manhole of the Nomad, still grinning. Carr hesitated, resisting the impulse to take Mado at his word. He looked around. The landing stage had been deserted, but people now were approaching. People not to be tolerated at the moment. He saw Courtney Davis, grim and determined. There'd be more arguments. Useless, but aggravating. Well, why not go? 
he decided to break away. What better chance? Suddenly he dived for the manhole of Mado's vessel, wriggled his way to the padded interior of the airlock. He heard the clang of the circular cover. Mado was clamping it to its gasketed seat. Let's go! he shouted. Chapter 2 Into the Heavens the directors of International Airways stared foolishly when they saw Carr Parker and the giant Martian enter the mysterious ship which was a trespasser on their landing stage. They gazed incredulously as the gleaming, torpedo-shaped vessel arose majestically from its position. There was no evidence of motive power other than a sudden radiation from its hull plates of faintly crackling streamers of silver light. They fell back in alarm as it pointed its nose skyward and accelerated with incredible rapidity, the silver energy bathing them in its blinding luminescence. They burst forth an excited recrimination when it vanished into the blue. Courtney Davis shook his fist after the departing vessel and swore mightily. Carr Parker forgot them entirely when he clambered into the bucket seat beside Mado, who sat at the nomad's controls. He was free at last, free to probe the mysteries of outer space, to roam the skies with this Martian he had admired since boyhood. "'Glad you came?' Mado asked his terrestrial friend. "'You bet. But tell me about yourself. How have you been? And how come you've rebelled, too? I haven't seen you for a long time, you know. Why, well, it's been years.' "'No, oh, I'm all right. Guess I got fed up with things about the same way you did.' Knew last time I saw you that you were feeling as I did. That's why I came after you. But this vessel, the Nomad, I didn't know such things were in existence. How does it operate? It seems quite different from the usual ether liners. It's a mystery ship, invented and built by Thragis, a discredited scientist of my country. Spent a fortune on it, and then went broke and killed himself. I bought it from the ex-executors for a song. They thought it was a pile of junk, but the plans and notes of the inventor were there, and I studied them well. The ship is a marvel car, utilizes gravitational attraction and reversal as a propelling force, and can go like the old boy himself. I've hit 2,000 miles a second with her. A second? Why, well, that's ten times as fast as the regular liners. Must use a whale of a lot of fuel. And where do you keep it? Uh, the fuel, I mean. Make it right on board. I'm telling you, Carr, the Nomad has no equal. She's a corker. I'll say she is. But what do you mean, make the fuel? Cosmic rays. Everywhere in space, you know. Seems they are the result of violent concentrations of energy that cause the birth of atoms. Thragis doped out a collector of these rays that takes them for their paths and concentrates them in a retort where there's a spongy metal catalyst that never deteriorates. Here there is a reaction to the original action out in space and new atoms are born. Simple ones, hydrogen. But what could be sweeter for use in one of our regular atomic motors? The energy of disintegration is used to drive the generators of the artificial gravity field. And there you are. Sounds complicated, but really isn't. And nothing to get out of whack, either. Beats the rocket motors and bulky fuel of the regular liners a mile, doesn't it? But since when are you a navigator, Mato? Don't need to be a navigator with the Nomad. She's automatic, once the controls are set. Say we wish to visit Venus. The telescope is sighted on that body, and the gravity force is adjusted so it will be attracted in that direction and repelled in the opposite direction. Then we can go to bed and forget it. The movement of the body in its orbit makes no difference because the force follows wherever it goes. See? The speed increases until the opposing forces are equal. When deceleration commences and we gradually slow down until within 10,000 miles of the body when the nomad automatically stops. Doesn't move either until we awaken to take the controls. How's that for simple? Good enough. But suppose a wandering meteor, or a tiny asteroid, gets in the way. At our speed, it wouldn't have to be as big as your fist to go through us like a shot. Oh, taken care of, my dear car. I told you, Thragis was a whiz. 
Such a happenstance would disturb the delicate balance of the energy compensators, and the course of the nomad would instantly alter to dodge the foreign object. Once passed by, the course would immediately again be resumed. Some ship, the nomad. Carr was delighted with the explanations. I'm sold on her, and on the trip. Where are we now, and where bound? Mado glanced at the instrument board. Nearly a million miles out and headed for that Sargasso Sea I told you about, he said. It isn't visible in the telescope, but I've got it marked by the stars. Out between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, a quarter of a billion miles away. But we'll average better than a thousand miles a second. Be there in three days of your time. How can there be a sea out there in space? Oh, that's just my name for it. Most peculiar thing, though. There's a vast, billowy sort of a cloud. Twists and weaves around as if alive. Looks like seaweed or something. And car, I swear, there are things floating around in it. Wrecks. Something damn peculiar, anyway. I vow I saw a signal. People marooned there or something. Sort of scared me, and I didn't stay around for long, as there was an awful pull from the mass. Had to use full reversal of the gravity force to get away. Now, why didn't you tell me that before? That's something to think about. Like the ancient days of ocean-going ships on Earth. Tell you? How could I tell you? You've been questioning me ever since I first saw you, and I've been busy every minute answering you. Carr laughed and slid from his seat to the floor. He felt curiously light and loose-jointed. A single step carried him to one of the stanchions of the control cabin, and he clung to it for a moment to regain his equilibrium. What's wrong? he demanded. No internal gravity mechanisms on the Nomad? Sure is, but it's adjusted for Martian gravity. You'll get along, but it wouldn't be so easy for me with Earth gravity. I'd have to wear the portable G-ray all the time, and well, that's not so comfortable. All right with you? Oh, certainly. I didn't understand. Carr saw that his friend had unstrapped the black box from his shoulders. He didn't blame him. Glad he wasn't a Martian. It was mighty inconvenient for them on Venus or Terra. Their bodies, large and of double the specific gravity, were not easily handled where gravity was nearly three times their own. The Venusians and Terrestrials were more fortunate when on Mars, for they could become accustomed to the altered conditions. Only had to be careful they didn't overdo. He remembered vividly a quick move he had made on his first visit to Mars. Carried him twenty feet to slam against a granite pedestal. Bad cut that gave him and the exertion in the rarefied atmosphere had him gasping painfully. He walked to one of the ports and peered through its thick window. Mado was fussing with the controls. The velvety blackness of the heavens, the myriad diamond points of clear brilliance. Cold, too, it looked out there, and awesomely vast. The sun and earth had been left behind and could not be seen. But Carr didn't care. The heavens were marvelous when viewed without the obstruction of an atmosphere but he'd seen them often enough on his many business trips to Mars and Venus. "'Ready for bed?' Mado startled him with a tap on the shoulder. "'Why, if you say so. But you haven't showed me through with a nomad yet.' "'All the time in the universe for that. Man, don't you realize you're free? Come, let's grab some sleep. Need it out here. The ship will be here when we wake up. She's flying herself right now. Fast, too.' Carr looked at the velocity indicator. Seven hundred miles a second and still accelerating. He felt suddenly tired, and when Mado opened the door of a sleeping cabin, its spotless bunk looked very inviting. He turned in without protest. End of Vagabonds of Space Section 19 Chapter 2 Recording by Jason Dempsey Highland, New York